Part two, chapter fifteen of Madame Bovary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roz Romero. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. Translated by Eleanor Marks Aveling. Part two, chapter fifteen. The crowd was waiting against the wall symmetrically enclosed between the balustrades at the corner of the neighboring streets huge bills repeated in quaint letters lucie de la memoire lagardie opera etc the weather was fine the people were hot perspiration trickled amid the curls and handkerchiefs taken from pockets were mopping red foreheads and now and then a warm wind that blew from the river gently stirred the border of the tick awnings hanging from the doors of the public houses a little lower down however one was refreshed by a current of icy air that smelt of tallow leather and oil this was an exhalation from the rue de charrettes full of large black warehouses where they made casks for fear of seeming ridiculous Emma, before going in, wished to have a little stroll in the harbor, and Bovary prudently kept his tickets in his hand, in the pocket of his trousers, which he pressed against his stomach. Her heart began to beat as soon as she reached the vestibule. She involuntarily smiled with vanity on seeing the crowd rushing to the right by the other corridor, while she went up the staircase to the reserved seats. She was as pleased as a child to push with her finger the large tapestry door. She breathed in with all her might the dusty smell of the lobbies, and when she was seated in her box she bent forward with the air of a duchess. The theatre was beginning to fill. Opera glasses were taken from their cases, and the subscribers, catching sight of one another, were bowing. They came to seek relaxation in the fine arts after the anxieties of business. But business was not forgotten. They still talked cottons, spirits of wine, or indigo. The heads of old men were to be seen, inexpressive and peaceful, with their hair and complexions looking like silver metals, tarnished by steam of lead. The young beaux were strutting about in the pit, showing in the opening of their waistcoats their pink or apple-green cravats, and Madame Bovary from above admired them leaning on their canes with golden knobs in the open palm of their yellow gloves. Now the lights of the orchestra were lit, the luster let down from the ceiling, throwing by the glimmering of its facets a sudden gaiety over the theatre. Then the musicians came in, one after the other, and first there was the protracted hubbub of the basses grumbling, violins squeaking, cornets trumpeting, flutes and flagellates fifing. But three knocks were heard on the stage. A rolling of drums began. The brass instruments played some chords, and the curtain rising discovered a country scene. It was the crossroads of a wood, with a fountain shaded by an oak to the left. Peasants and lords with plaids on their shoulders were singing a hunting song together. Then a captain suddenly came on, who evoked the spirit of evil by lifting both his arms to heaven. Another appeared. They went away, and the hunters started afresh. She felt herself transported to the reading of her youth, into the midst of Walter Scott. She seemed to hear through the mist the sound of the Scotch bagpipes, re-echoing over the heather. Then her remembrance of the novel, helping her understand the libretto, she followed the story, phrase by phrase, while vague thoughts that came back to her dispersed at once again with the bursts of music. She gave herself up to the lullaby of the melodies, and felt all her being vibrate, as if the violin bows were drawn over her nerves. She had not eyes enough to look at the costumes, the scenery, the actors, the painted trees that shook when anyone walked, and the velvet caps, cloaks, swords, all those imaginary things that floated amid the harmony, as in the atmosphere of another world. 
but a young woman stepped forward, throwing a purse to a squire in green. She was left alone, and the flute was heard like the murmur of a fountain or the warbling of birds. Lucy attacked her cavatina in G major bravely. She plained of love. She longed for wings. Emma, too, fleeing from life, would have liked to fly away in an embrace. Suddenly Edgar Ligardy appeared. He had that splendid pallor that gives something of the majesty of marble to the ardent races of the South. His vigorous form was tightly clad in a brown-colored doublet. A small chiseled poniard hung against his left thigh, and he cast round laughing looks, showing his white teeth. They said that a Polish princess, having heard him sing one night on the beach at Biarritz, where he mended boats, had fallen in love with him. She had ruined herself for him. He had deserted her for other women. And this sentimental celebrity did not fail to enhance his artistic reputation. The diplomatic mummer took care always to slip into his advertisements some poetic phrase on the fascination of his person and the susceptibility of his soul. A fine organ, imperturbable coolness, more temperament than intelligence, more power of emphasis than of real singing, made up the charm of this admirable charlatan nature, in which it was something of the hairdresser and the toreador. From the first scene he evoked enthusiasm. He pressed Lucy in his arms. He left her. He came back. He seemed desperate. He had outbursts of rage, then elegiac gurglings of infinite sweetness, and the notes escaped from his bare neck, full of sobs and kisses. Emma leant forward to see him, clutching the velvet of the box with her nails. She was filling her heart with these melodious lamentations that were drawn out to the accompaniment of the double basses, like the cries of the drowning in the tumult of a tempest. She recognized all the intoxication and the anguish that had almost killed her. The voice of a prima donna seemed to her to be but echoes of her conscience, and this illusion that charmed her as some very thing of her own life. But no one on earth had loved her with such love. He had not wept like Edgar that last moonlit night, when they said, "'Tomorrow, tomorrow!' The theatre rang with cheers. They recommenced the entire movement. The lovers spoke of the flowers on their tombs, of vows, exile, fate, hopes. And when they uttered the final adieu, Emma gave a sharp cry that mingled with the vibrations of the last chords. "'But why?' asked Bovary. "'Does that gentleman persecute her?' "'No, no,' she answered. "'He is her lover.' Yet he vows vengeance on her family, while the other one who came on before said, I love Lucy and she loves me. Besides, he went off with her father arm in arm, for he certainly is her father, isn't he? The ugly little man with a cock's feather in his hat? Despite Emma's explanations, as soon as the recitative duet began, in which Gilbert lays bare his abominable machinations to his master Ashton, Charles, seeing the false troth ring, that is to deceive Lucy, thought it was a love gift sent by Edgar. He confessed, moreover, that he did not understand the story because of the music, which interfered very much with the words. "'What does it matter?' said Emma. "'Do be quiet.' "'Yes, but you know,' he went on, leaning against her shoulder, "'I like to understand things.' "'Be quiet! Be quiet!' she cried impatiently. Lucy advanced, half supported by her women, a wreath of orange blossoms in her hair, and paler than the whiter satin of her gown. Emma dreamed of her marriage day. She saw herself at home again, amid the corn in the little path as they walked to the church. Oh, why had not she, like this woman, resisted, implored? She, on the contrary, had been joyous, without seeing the abyss into which she was throwing herself. Ah, if in the freshness of her beauty before the soiling of marriage and the disillusions of adultery, she could have anchored her life upon some great strong heart, then virtue, tenderness, voluptuousness, and duty-blending, she would never have fallen from so high a happiness. 
but that happiness, no doubt, was a lie, invented for the despair of all desire. She now knew the smallness of the passions that art exaggerated. So, striving to divert her thoughts, Emma determined now to see in this reproduction of her sorrows only a plastic fantasy, well enough to please the eye, and she even smiled internally with disdainful pity when at the back of the stage, under the velvet hangings, a man appeared in a black cloak. His large Spanish hat fell at a gesture he made, and immediately the instruments and the singers began the sextet. Edgar, flashing with fury, dominated all the others with his clearer voice. Ashton hurled homicidal provocations at him in deep notes. Lucy uttered her shrill plaint. Arthur at one side, his modulated tones in the middle register, and the bass of the minister pealed forth like an organ, while the voices of the women, repeating his words, took them up in chorus delightfully. They were all in a row gesticulating, and anger, vengeance, jealousy, terror, and stupefaction breathed forth at once from their half-open mouths. The outraged lover brandished his naked sword. His guipier ruffle rose with jerks to the movement of his chest, and he walked from right to left with long strides, clanking against the boards, the silver gilt spurs of his soft boots, widening out at the ankles. He, she thought, must have an exhaustible love to lavish it upon the crowd with such an effusion. All her small fault-findings faded before the poetry of the part that absorbed her, and drawn towards this man by the illusion of the character, she tried to imagine to herself his life, that life resonant, extraordinary, splendid, and that might have been hers if fate had willed it. They would have known one another, loved one another. With him through all the kingdoms of Europe she would have travelled from capital to capital, sharing his fatigue and his pride, picking up the flowers thrown to him, herself embroidering his costumes. Then each evening at the back of a box, behind the golden trellis work, she would have drunken eagerly the expansions of this soul that would have sung for her alone. From the stage, even as he acted, he would have looked at her. But the mad idea seized her that he was looking at her. It was certain. She longed to run to his arms, to take refuge in his strength, as in the incarnation of love itself, and to say to him, to cry out, Take me away, carry me with you, let us go. Thine, thine all my ardor and all my dreams. The curtain fell. The smell of the gas mingled with that of the breasts, the waving of the fans, made the air more suffocating. Emma wanted to go out. The crowd filled the corridors, and she fell back in her armchair with palpitations that choked her. Charles, fearing that she would faint, ran to the refreshment room to get a glass of barley water. He had great difficulty in getting back to his seat, for his elbows were jerked at every step because of the glass he held in his hands, and he even spilt three-quarters on the shoulders of a Rouen lady in short sleeves who felt the cold liquid running down to her loins uttered cries like a peacock, as if she were being assassinated. Her husband, who was a mill-owner, railed at the clumsy fellow, and while she was with her handkerchief wiping up the stains from her handsome cherry-colored taffeta gown, he angrily muttered about indemnity, costs, reimbursement. At last Charles reached his wife, saying to her, quite out of breath, Ma foi, I thought I should have to stay there. This is such a crowd, such a crowd. He added, Just guess whom I met up there, Monsieur Leon. Leon? Himself. He's coming along to pay his respects. And as he finished these words, the ex clerk of Yonville entered the box. He held out his hand with the ease of a gentleman, and Madame Bovary extended hers without duty obeying the attraction of a stronger will. She had not felt it since that spring evening when the rain fell upon the green leaves, and they had said good-bye standing at the window. But soon recalling herself to the necessities of the situation, with an effort she shook off the torpor of her memories, and began stammering a few hurried words. A good day! A wha what you hear? Silence! 
cried a voice from the pit, for the third act was beginning. So you are at Rouen? Yes. And since when? Turn them out! Turn them out! People were looking at them. They were silent. But from that moment she listened no more, and the chorus of the guests, the scene between Ashton and his servant, the grand duet in D major, all were for her as far off as if the instruments had grown less sonorous and the characters more remote. She remembered the games at cards at the druggists, and the walk to the nurses, the reading in the arbor, the tete-a-tete -tete by the fireside, all that poor love, so calm and so protracted, so discreet, so tender, and that she had nevertheless forgotten. And why had he come back? What combination of circumstances had brought him back into her life? He was standing behind her, leaning with his shoulder against the wall of the box. Now and again she felt herself shuddering beneath the hot breath from his nostrils falling upon her hair. "'Does this amuse you?' said he, bending over her so closely that the end of his moustache brushed her cheeks. She replied carelessly, "'Oh, dear me, no, not much.' Then he proposed that they should leave the theatre and go and take an ice somewhere. "'Oh, no, not yet. Let us stay,' said Bovary. "'Her hair's undone. This is going to be tragic.' But the mad scene did not at all interest Emma, and the acting of the singer seemed to her exaggerated. "'She screams too loud,' said she, turning to Charles, who was listening. "'Yes, a little,' he replied undecided between the frankness of his pleasure and his respect for his wife's opinion. Then, with the sigh, Léon said, "'The heat is unbearable, yes!' "'Do you feel unwell?' asked Bovary. "'Yes, I'm stifling. Let us go.' Monsieur Léon put her long lace shawl carefully about her shoulders, and all three went off to sit down in the harbour, in the open air, outside the windows of a café. First they spoke of her illness, although Emma interrupted Charles from time to time, for fear, she said, of boring Monsieur Léon, and the latter told them that he had come to spend two years at Rouen in a large office, in order to get practice in his profession, which was different in Normandy and Paris. Then he inquired after Bertha, the Oma, Mère Le François, and as they had, in the husband's presence, nothing more to say one another, the conversation soon came to an end. People coming out of the theatre passed along the pavement, humming or shouting at the top of their voices, O bel ange, ma Lucie! Then Léon, played the dilettante, began to talk music. He had seen Tamburini, Rubini, Persiani, Grisi, and compared with them Lagardy, despite his grand outbursts, was nowhere. O oh, beautiful angel, my Lucie! Yet, interrupted Charles, who was slowly slipping his rum sherbet, they say that he's quite admirable in the last act. I regret leaving before the end, because it was beginning to amuse me. Why, said the clerk, he'll soon give another performance. But Charles replied that they were going back next day. Unless, he added, turning to his wife, you would like to stay alone, kitten? And changing his tactics at this unexpected opportunity that presented itself to his hopes, the young man sang the praises of Lagardy in the last number. It was really superb, sublime. Then Charles insisted, You would get back on Sunday. Come, make up your mind. You are wrong if you feel that this is doing you the least good. The tables round them, however, were emptying. A waiter came and stood discreetly near them. Charles, who understood, took out his purse. The clerk held back his arm, and did not forget to leave two more pieces of silver that he made clink on the marble. "'I'm really sorry,' said Bovary, "'about the money which you are—' The other made a careless gesture full of cordiality, and taking his hat said, "'It is settled, isn't it? Tomorrow at six o'clock.' Charles explained once more that he could not absent himself longer, but that nothing prevented Emma. But— she stammered with a strange smile. I'm not sure. Well, you must think it over. We'll see. Night brings counsel. Then to Leon, who was walking along with them. Now that you're in our part of the world, I hope you'll come and ask for us some dinner now and then. 
the clerk declared he would not fail to do so being obliged moreover to go to yonville on some business for his office and they parted before the saint herblon passage just as the clock in the cathedral struck half past eleven end of part two chapter fifteen